seat. Let's talk for a bit. Uh, I excused uh, one of the fellow jurors a moment ago uh, because there, he indicated that he had read an article in the Union Leader. There was an article about this case in the Union Leader yesterday, yeah, this morning, actually. Uh, did anybody else read that article? Did anybody else have any uh, contact with any other source concerning this case? Satisfactory. It's important, as you know, uh, that you folks deliberate on the facts and not any extrinsic information or, or editorialism. Editorialism. So that's why I speak, excuse your fellow juror, uh, so there wouldn't be any exterior or uh, extraneous influences. So you, you got to remember, this case is consolidated. There's three three defendants consolidated for one purpose, well, for the trial. But you have to deliberate independently. Each of them has a right to be uh, viewed separately. Each case is separate, okay? Keep that in mind. It's, it's not yay or nay on all or nothing. Do you know what I mean? It's deliberate on each of the defendants, okay? Understand that? Okay. So here, here are my instructions as, as I think the state indicated, I will send in the instructions so you'll have a copy of, of these um, with you to refer to, but um, please pay particular attention uh, to what I have to say. Members of the jury, the evidence arguments in this case have been completed. I'll now instruct you as to the law that applies in this case. You will then retire to decide a verdict. In order to reach a fair and just verdict, you must understand and follow the law as I explain it to you. For example, we have to understand the definition of the crime with which the defendants are charged. We have to, have to understand how convinced one way or the other you should be before you reach a verdict. You have to understand what to consider in deciding whether to believe a particular witness. These instructions will explain the law as to these and other matters so that you can reach a fair and just verdict. It is your duty as jurors to follow all of the instructions I'm about to give you regardless of any opinion you may have as to what the law ought to be. The law as I explain it to you is the law you must follow in reaching your verdict. It is up to you to decide the facts in this case. You must decide the facts solely from the evidence in this trial. You must apply the law I will give to you in these instructions to the facts and in this way reach a fair and just verdict. You should decide the facts in this case without prejudice, without fear, and without sympathy. The fact that the defendants have been arrested or charged and brought to stand trial is not evidence of guilt. The complaint or charge is simply a way of giving the defendants notice of the accusations against them, a formal way of accusing the defendants of the crime in order to bring the defendants to trial. In your deliberations, you must not consider the fact of the defendant's arrest, the complaint, or the defendant being brought to stand trial as evidence of guilt of the defendants. The possible punishment the defendants may receive if you return verdicts, excuse me, <coughs> the possible punishment the defendants may receive if you return guilty verdicts should not influence your decision. The duty of imposing <coughs> sentences for the judge, you should base your verdicts only on the evidence presented without considering the issue of punishment. You've heard the lawyers discuss the facts of the law and their arguments to you and through the questioning of witnesses. Arguments are not evidence. Their purpose is to help you understand the evidence and the law. If the lawyers have stated the law differently from the laws I explained to you in these instructions, then you must follow these instructions and ignore the statements of the lawyers. If the lawyers have stated the evidence differently from how you recall it, then you should follow your own memory of what the evidence was. Now the evidence in this case consists of the view, the testimony under oath of the witnesses, the exhibits which you'll have uh, that have been admitted in the evidence and the stipulations I've read to you. You must base your decision solely on the evidence presented. During the trial, the lawyers made objections. The lawyers are supposed to object when they believe that certain evidence is not admissible. If I sustained an objection or excluded any evidence, you must not guess as to what the answer or evidence would have been. If I ordered that a question and answer be stricken from the record, you must not consider either the question or the answer as evidence. Likewise, if I over, overruled an objection and permitted a witness to answer the question, you must not give that testimony any greater weight than any other testimony simply because I allowed its introduction over an objection. 
I'm not expressing views as to the importance of evidence when I make my rulings. I am merely applying the law as is my duty. If you believe that I have expressed or suggested an opinion as to the facts in my rulings, you should ignore such an opinion. The court in this case, as in all cases, is completely neutral and impartial. It is up to you alone to decide the facts in this case. You may not guess or speculate about evidence. You may only consider what has been introduced into evidence and the reasonable inferences you can draw from the evidence. By reasonable inferences, I mean conclusions which reason and common sense lead you to draw from the facts that are proven to your satisfaction. Counsel. Can I see a brief? Just a second. Page and a half description of the difference between direct and circumstantial evidence. The reality is that there, I don't think counsel, I think there's any circumstantial evidence, all direct evidence. So I'm not, I'm not even going to go into that definition. And that's why I brought, I brought them up. I've always, I've always found the definition confusing. I don't want to confuse you any more than you already are. Okay. So in viewing the evidence, you should consider the quality of the evidence, not the quantity. It's not the number of witnesses or quantity of evidence that is important, but rather what the witnesses have to say and how persuaded you are. In deciding whether the state has proven the charges against the defendant, you must decide the credibility of witnesses. That is, it's up to you to decide whom to believe. If there's any conflict between the witnesses, then you must resolve the, uh, the conflict and decide what the truth is. Simply because a witness has taken an oath to tell the truth, does not mean that you have to accept the testimony as true. In deciding which witness to believe, you should use your common sense and judgment. I suggest you consider a number of factors. Whether the witness appeared to be candid, whether the witness appeared worthy of belief, the appearance and demeanor of the witness, whether the witness had an interest in the outcome of the case, whether the witness had any reason for not telling the truth, whether what the witness said seemed reasonable or probable, whether what the witness said seemed unreasonable or inconsistent with other evidence of the case or with prior statements by the witness, and whether the witness had any friendship or animosity towards other people in the case. In deciding which witness to believe and how much of their testimony to believe, you should consider both the direct and cross-examination of the witnesses, regardless of who called the witness. You can accept all of what a witness has said, you can reject all of what a witness has said, or you can accept some of it and reject some. Now under our constitutions, all defendants in criminal cases are presumed to be innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. The burden of proving guilt rests entirely on the state. The defendants do not have to prove their innocence. The defendants enter this courtroom as innocent persons, and you must consider them to be innocent persons unless and until the state convinces you beyond a reasonable doubt that they are guilty of every element of the alleged offense. If after all the evidence and arguments, you have a reasonable doubt as to whether the defendants have committed any one or more of the elements of an offense charge, then you must find the defendants not guilty as to that offense. A reasonable doubt is just what the words would ordinarily imply. To use the word reasonable means simply that the doubt must be reasonable rather than unreasonable. It must be a doubt based on reason. It's not a frivolous or fanciful doubt, nor is it one that can be easily explained away. Rather, is such a doubt based upon reason that remains after consideration of all the evidence that the state has offered against it? The testimony must use is this. If you have a reasonable doubt as to whether the state has proven any one or more of the elements of a crime charge, you must find the defendants not guilty. However, if you find the state has proven all of the elements of an offense charge beyond a reasonable doubt, you should find the defendants guilty as to each offense. Now, even if you find the state has proven each and every element of an offense charged beyond a reasonable doubt, you may still find the defendants not guilty if you have a conscientious feeling 
that a not guilty verdict would be a fair result in this case. Now, the state constitution guarantees uh, the pre preservation of the freedoms of speech and assembly. However, however, under the language of the constitution, neither of these rights is an absolute right. That is to say, the rights of speech and assembly are subject to some restrictions. Under the law, the government can restrict the time, place, or manner of speech in public parks. If the restriction is reasonable, content neutral, narrowly serves a significant government interest and allows other opportunities for expression. The laws of New Hampshire are, uh, the laws of New Hampshire set forth, set forth certain crimes. If it's not defined in our criminal code, it's not a crime, and each crime has precise definitions. The definition of each crime requires the state to prove both that the defendants committed certain acts and they acted with a certain mental state. So crimes have at least two parts, an action and a mental state. In deciding whether a person is guilty of a crime, it's necessary for you to know both what a person's actions were and what his or her mental state was. The words mental state refer to what a person mentally believes his physical acts will accomplish and the word act refers to a physical deed. For a person to be guilty of a crime, he, he or she must have the requisite mental state, and he or she must have physically acted to do something that is criminal. Now the matter of determining a person's mental state is something that you will have to decide. There's often no direct evidence of the mental state because there's no way of examining the operation of a person's mind. So you should consider all the facts, all the circumstances, and the evidence in this case, in deciding whether or not the state has proven the requisite mental state. Now, as you know, each of the defendants is charged with a count of criminal trespass. The definition of the crime of criminal trespass has four parts or elements. The state must prove each part of the definition beyond a reasonable doubt. Thus, the state must prove, one, that the defendants entered a place or remained in a place and that the defendants knew that they were neither licensed nor privileged to enter or remain upon that place, and the defendants were in that place in defiance of an order to leave or in defiance of an order not to enter. And fourth, that such an order to leave or not to enter was personally communicated to the defendants by the owner of that place or by someone other uh, with authority to do so. Now, part of the definition of criminal trespass is that the defendants acted knowingly. A person acts knowingly when he or she is aware of the nature of his or her conduct or the circumstances under which he or she acted. The state does not have to prove that the defendant specifically intended or desired a particular result. What the state must prove is that the defendants were aware of the nature of their con conduct. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this case is important to both of the parties, the state and the defendants. In your deliberations, you should follow these instructions which the court has given you. You should not decide this case out of bias or sympathy, but with honesty and understanding. You should make a conscientious effort to determine what a fair and just result is in this case, because that is your highest duties, duty as officers of this court. Your verdict must represent the considered judgment of each juror. In order to return a verdict, it is necessary that each and every juror agree with the verdict. Your verdict must be unanimous. It is your duty as jurors to consult with one another and to deliberate with a view towards reaching an agreement if you can do so without violence to your own individual judgment. Each of you must decide the case uh, for yourself, but do so only after impartial consideration of the evidence with your fellow jurors. In the course of your deliberations, do not hesitate to re-examine your views and to change your opinion if you are convinced it is erroneous. But do not surrender your honest conviction as to the weight or effect of the evidence <coughs> solely because of the opinion of your fellow jurors or merely for the purpose of returning a verdict. Now, if it becomes necessary during your deliberations to, communi to communicate with me, you may send me a note through, through the court officer signed by the foreperson or by any one or more members of the jury. No member of the jury should attempt to uh, communicate with me by any means other than assigned writing, and I will not communicate with any member of the jury on any subject touching on the merits of this case or other, other than in writing or orally here in open court. Now bear in mind also that you should never reveal to anybody, not even to me, how the jury stands numerically or otherwise on the questions before you until you've reached an unanimous verdict. Counsel, you have anything to add? Have your honor, thank you.
So uh, we're going to pick our alternates. We do it by lot. And uh, our four person. So I guess you have the honor of picking the two alternates. No, we have the same. So jurors number 12 and 14, you're going to be serving as our alternates. I thank you for the time you uh, spend with us and your dedication to the, the process. Um, where, where are you? Uh, where, where are you from? Yeah, we're Amherst and we're from where? Okay. The reason I asked is, is if, if, if deliberation goes over into Monday, they're, they're both about the same distance, so we're going to choose by lot who comes back if there's a if there's a need to. Okay, and I'm going to uh, have the state pick the uh, four person. Juror number ten. Where are you? Uh, let me let me explain to you what the four person generally does, and then you can tell me whether you want to serve in that capacity. Okay. Really, your job is to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to speak up and participate during the deliberation. If someone is uh, sitting back and, and not uh, participating, encourage them to speak up. Similarly, if someone, for lack of a better term, is monopolizing the conversation, ask them perhaps to sit back and listen to the, the views of others so that when you come back out, if you do with a unanimous word, uh, everyone will feel that they've had an opportunity to fully express their, themselves and, and render uh, opinions. You'd also be the person that generally would uh, write out any questions to send back to, to me and to the lawyers. Uh, any one of you or any number of you can do that if there's a disagreement between the four person and other members. But generally, it's the, uh, the four person that writes it up, signs it, dates it, and times it. Uh, and you would be the person that stands with the verdict. In other words, you'd all come back out if there's a unanimous verdict, and, and you would be the one that responds to inquiries from uh, Clerk Sapper. You feel comfortable serving that capacity? Yes. All right, then you're going to be our four person. I, I, I will warn uh, you folks in advance that we'll try our best to answer any questions you have, but certain sometimes the questions uh, can't be fully answered because of rules of evidence and, and other uh, other rulings in the case, I guess if that's what I'm saying. So I'm going to uh, have you deliberate. Uh, you deliberate for a period of time that I'm Tony's going to, have you already given them the, uh, have they already got their menus? No. <laughs> You'll also be able to lobster. I would say. <laughs> <laughs> you'll get a men you'll get menu so that uh, uh, you don't have to deliberate through lunch. But if you decide to, that's in your problem also. All right. Thank you very much. We'll see you in a little bit. All right.